Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisette Coley, and as Vice President of Parapsychology Foundation, on behalf of our Board of Trustees and our President Eileen Coley, we welcome you all here this evening. We have a very full program as we seek to mark the 150th anniversary of spiritualism. Our main presenter, uh, John Patrick Divini, uh, is an author who's written an excellent book, uh, Biography of Pascal Beverly Randolph, a 19th century black American spiritualist, Rosicrucian, and sex magician, which is a particularly interesting title, but uh, you're going to have to buy his book and poke your nose in it at a later date because he's going to be presenting an equally interesting uh, theme this evening on spirit painting. Uh, as many of you may know, the Foundation gives uh, various scholarships and uh, awards and during the year, and one of those awards is the D. Scott Rogo Award for Parapsychological Literature. The recipient of the Rogo Award is here with us this evening, Barbara Weisberg, and she's involved in writing a manuscript to do with spiritualism, so she's graciously uh, agreed to do a brief introduction of spiritualism for us this evening. So I'm going to turn you over to the very capable hands of Barbara Weisberg, followed by John Patrick Divini. Barbara, please. Hello. 150 years ago, John and Margaret Fox began to hear some very strange noises in the cottage they had rented in Hydesville, New York, a farming community about 30 miles away from Rochester. John and Margaret had moved to Hydesville to be near two of their adult children who were living in the vicinity. And they still have living with them their two youngest daughters, 11-year-old Kathy and 14-year-old Maggie. The sounds that began to plague the family were varied. Uh, sometimes they were knocks that sounded as if someone was at the front door. Sometimes it sounded as if somebody was moving furniture overhead. Uh, and sometimes it felt like a jar, a tremulous motion uh, on, on furniture jar, actually a chair. So the family, when they heard these, which generally occurred after dark, uh, would get up, search the house, and find nothing. On March 31st, uh, their married son David came to visit, and David tried to reassure his parents and said there was absolutely nothing wrong, and he was sure that they would find the cause. But Margaret Fox, who allegedly had a streak of ESP in her family, was very frightened by now. Uh, she told the children that night to go to bed early, even before dark, and she told them to lie still and not let any noises that occurred disturb them. Well, probably not surprisingly, a whole racket of raps broke out at that point, and Maggie sat up and she snapped her fingers, and the raps seemed to imitate that snapping sound. And then Maggie got into the action, and she said, count one, two, three, four, and the invisible rapper rapped back four times. At this point, Margaret decided that she was going to ask some questions, and she asked the invisible rapper to count ten and it did so, indicating that there was an intelligence at work. This, this thing could count. Uh, then she said, what are the ages of each of my children? And the ages of each of her six surviving children were correctly wrapped. And at this point, Margaret said, are you a human being? And there was silence. And she said, are you a spirit? And if you are, knock <coughs> twice. And there were two raps. Uh, and modern American spiritualism, I think, was, was born at that moment when the spirit wrapped its presence. And it turned out, through a variety of questions and answers, to uh, declare itself the spirit of a peddler who'd been murdered in the Fox Cottage five years before 
before the Fox family had moved in. Within a couple of years, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, that's one estimate, another estimate is a million, were investigating or believing the, um, the notion that death is only a transition, the spirits of those who have made that transition survive us in it and are around us in our daily life and that they communicate with us through the agency of mediums, men and women who can receive and transmit spirit messages. And back in Hinesville in 1848, 150 years ago, in April, uh, shortly after the original raps were heard, people began to realize that the raps almost always occurred in the presence of the little girls, Kathy and Tomagi. Uh, and they became spiritualism's founding mediums. Now, in some ways, it's probably true that they were more a catalyst for the movement, because in many respects, spiritualism was already present in the culture. Uh, in the 1830s and the 1840s, the Shakers had experienced spiritual communication and had written about it. Um, the ideas of the 18th century Swedish philosopher Emanuel Swedenborg and of his 19th century disciple Andrew Jackson Davis were becoming better known. And both of these men reported their conversations with spirits. And in fact, Andrew Jackson Davis talked about his conversations with the spirit of Swedenborg. Um, and mesmerism was very much in vogue, and mes mesmeric trances were almost identical to uh, the trances that mediums would later experience. Now, talking about it as present in the culture doesn't altogether account for its extremely rapid rise. And spiritualists would say that the spirits had, uh, had decided to announce their presence um, and make themselves known. Historians have given us a number of reasons for the very rapid rise of the movement. Um, and among those reasons, one would be that Hydesville was located in the burned over district of western New York. And this was an area that had already seen conventional thinking challenged uh, in many different ways. Uh, religious revivals, utopian movements had swept through that area, and people were very susceptible to um, beliefs that challenged orthodox ways of thinking. Uh, infant mortality rates were high in the 19th century. And once the notion of spirit communication became uh, a possibility, people really wanted to communicate with their dead, and particularly many of the families that became involved in spiritualism had a dead child um, and really <coughs> wanted very much to connect with the spirit of that child. And ironically, science itself uh, contributed to the rise of the movement. Uh, there were so many advances that seemed like miracles happening at the time that spiritualism seemed like one more miracle. The main metaphor for the movement was the spiritual telegraph. The telegraph had recently been invented, and uh, if people could communicate by invisible means, why couldn't mortals and immortals communicate by invisible means? The concrete manifestations of spiritualism, which were very varied, ramps, uh, spirit paintings, in the 1860s full form apparitions were important because they were considered visible auditory proof of immortality, what people called the great truth of immortality. And John Patrick Divini is here with us tonight to discuss all of the 
or many of the manifestations of uh, spiritualism, and in particular, spirit paintings. And I would second Lisette and say that his book is marvelous. It tells a very engrossing story and provides insight into the nature of spiritualism and is valuable and entertaining. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to, uh, my name's Pat Deveni, and I'm oh. delighted to be here. And uh, I want to speak tonight about um, a usually forgotten and ignored side of 19th century spirit, spiritualism, um, specifically spirit art, which was art um, created um, of spirits, pictures of spirits, and most impressively and most phenomenally wonderful um, pictures created by the spirits themselves. And I would add to what's just been said about the progress of spiritualism in the 19th century only this, um, which is if you look at um, spiritualism in its first 15 or 20 years of existence, the one thing that leaps out immediately is the progression that's constantly going on from a very simple phenomenon. The simple phenomenon was a knock, yes or no, usually leading questions as we like to say, um, to an alphabet code. And within two years, you had the, the uh, birth of light trance, automatic writing. You had full trance, where the spirits would speak directly through the bodies of the mediums. Um, you had uh, um, a tendency always toward greater the theatricality, as it were, in showmanship. Um, and I think there's many reasons for that. And it's most cynically put, I think the reason was competition for audiences. And that you can view this trend in spiritualism, and it detracts nothing from the truths of spiritualism, I believe. You can view this trend in spiritualism um, um, really as part of 19th century popular showmanship. And one aspect of that that uh, I'm particularly interested in and have been for several years um, is spirit art. Uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, where's the slide? Thing? Can you hear it for me? Um, I'll turn off the lights. Yeah. Alright, these are the Fox sisters that, uh, uh, that you've heard about. Uh, Leah on the left, and Kate in the middle, and Margaret on the right. Um, and this picture, these pictures were taken about 30 years after the events you just heard about. Um, after 30 years of exposés of fraudulent mediums, and a very hard life for the girls and their faces reflected here. Um, what was increasingly lost sight of in the progression of spiritualism from the simple knocking and rapping of the Fox sisters came upon in 1848 um, to the progression of spiritualism to um, the fully theatricalized version of spiritualism was the message of spiritualism itself, which was simply the individual can survive death. And what became increasingly prominent, as I said, was the showmanship. Now, spirit art itself began in the 1850s, almost at the very beginning of spiritualism. In 1852 in Ohio, at the Coons Family Spirit Rooms um, in Ohio, that the Jonathan Coons, who felt the calling, um, had set aside for the reception of spirit messages. And the, uh, can we have the next slide, please? Well, the, uh, um, this is actually the Davenport Brothers, it's out of order, out of order. but uh, by the mid-1850s, um, spiritualism had progressed from the simple um, knocking code that the Fox sisters had developed to a form of, of uh, stage uh, magicianship. This is Ira and William Davenport in the famous cabinet, if you know anything about the history of spiritualism, they traveled the world. England, Europe, um, and America with their show. And it was quite um, openly called a show. And they would challenge the audiences in each town they would visit to tie them up in some novel fashion. You can see here the cords on their legs and their hands run through usually uh, pins in the walls to keep them from moving. After the audience had satisfied themselves that they could not 
um, uh, move or cheat in any way, the doors were closed, and almost immediately the spirits, or the Davenport brothers, if you're more cynically inclined, uh, would begin to play musical instruments, trumpets and violins and tambourines, which would float around the, uh, the seance halls. Give me the next slide, please. Uh, now, to go back to uh, um, the Coons family spirit rooms, um, in 1852 in Ohio, a special spirit who called himself an ancient spirit by the name of John King uh, began to appear uh, before the Coons family uh, in their spirit rooms in Ohio. Um, and he called himself the master of paints, the servant and scholar of God. Now, this is a reproduction of his revelations about the structure of the spiritual cosmos, produced, as we are told, through his influence on the son of Jonathan Coons. And I won't bother to explain it to you now, but basically it's a spiritual uh, cosmos fully as complex as those of late antiquity. It's a beautiful thing with vast tomes of uh, literature behind it explaining every piece of it. But the interesting thing is the impression by the spirit upon the son of Jonathan Coons of a picture, uh, which he then proceeds to uh, uh, draw himself. Now, leaving aside for the moment spirit photography, which is a separate and very fascinating category that's closely related to spirit art, um, spirit paintings fall into three categories, I believe. The first one um, consists uh, simply of paintings or drawings done from descriptions made by a seer by a medium. And an example of that would be uh, uh, Andrew Jackson Davis, who you may have heard of, who was a famous clairvoyant in the late 1840s and early 1850s. In his clairvoyant trances, he would see visions of truly amazing things. Um, he would come back, describe his visions to an ordinary artist who, in his ordinary state of consciousness, would proceed to draw these uh, drawings much like this. Um, and these uh, illustrations uh, would then uh, to then provide the covers for many spiritualist you know, journals of the time. There's nothing particularly extraordinary about this kind of spirit art um, unless we credit the, uh, the source of the art, which is the vision of the seer itself. A more interesting category of spirit art is the second category. Um, and that's a category that consists of a wide spectrum of phenomena. In its simplest form, um, the second category of spirit art is this. A spirit impresses upon uh, the medium an idea or a vision. Um, and then the medium himself or herself, since both men and women are spirit artists, in their normal state, paints or draws the work of art. In its most developed form, at the other end of the spectrum, this category of spirit art uh, is one in which the spirit totally takes over and replaces the consciousness of the medium, who is usually deeply entranced, and uses the medium's body as he would his own, if he had one, uh, to create the work. Now, the effect upon the observer of both of these kinds of spirit art is the same. As far as the audience is concerned, the audience simply sees the artist, medium, pick up a paintbrush and paint a picture all the while claiming to be under spirit control. Now this was by far the most common sort of spirit painting, undoubtedly because it's the hardest to falsify. It is very difficult to give the lie to a person who claims that the picture he has just done was really done by or through a spirit's influence. There are innumerable examples of this sort of spiritualist art in the literature of the 1850s through the end of the 19th century. But by the late 1850s, spirit painting had become a recognized part of the repertory of many mediums. The earliest notices of their activities come mainly from the Midwest, and there could be two reasons for this. Uh, the first is because of the sophistication, or lack thereof, of the audiences in the Midwest contrasted with those in the East Coast. Um, or more likely, I think it's because of the transmission of technique um, from one medium uh, to another. Give me the next slide, please. Oh, good. Now, um, this is a Rondo, an Indian um, spirit, Native American spirit, um, who began appearing in the 1860s to the 1880s. And he's part of a fascinating 
um, group of related phenomena in spiritualism at the time. The most elaborate form of the second category of uh, spirit art that I've been talking about is that produced by something called the Ancient Band. Um, and the Ancient Band um, actually worked from the 1860s through the 1880s. And the spirits of the band claim not to be the ordinary spirits of the dead your dead relatives or grandmother or a dead peddler who'd been killed in your house before you moved in. They claimed instead to be antediluvian Atlanteans and Egyptians and the like. Um, and this is actually a telling indication, I think, of the, the trend in, in spiritualism um, away from the sim simplicity of spiritualism itself toward occultism, but that should be the subject of another talk. Um, the medium uh, for the ancient band were a couple. Wella and Pet Anderson. Wella, it was always emphasized, was a mechanic um, and a cabinet maker with little schooling and no formal art training, though he had, of course, as I found out, worked as a sign painter in his youth. In 1869, General J. Winchester learned from a medium named Cooper in Ohio that a band of ancient spirits was hovering around him, and later that year he met the Andersons, who confirmed that fact and told him that the band wished to give him their portraits, through Wella Anderson, of course, and for a fee. Winchester relates the happenings of the first seance. A sheet of drawing paper was held in my hand for a few minutes to be magnetized, an irregular piece being torn from one corner for purposes of identification. When the artist went into his studio, and after an absence of about 18 minutes, returned with a lifelike sketch of Orlando which corresponded accurately with the description given me in a letter from Mr. Cooper, the medium in Ohio, several months previously. Give me the next slide, right? So this, is, uh, this is General Winchester, who became the uh, producer of the traveling road show that the ancient band began, became in the 1870s. Now, Winchester said that it usually took Wella Anderson about 12 minutes to do the actual drawing, which then required a couple of more hours to complete, as he called it. Though the resulting pictures are not particularly impressive, Winchester thought that they were miracles. Um, give me one more, uh, the next slide, man. This is another example of the, uh, of the Anderson's uh, spirit art, um, and it's fairly typical of, of their art, as was in Rondo before. Um, this is White Feather, uh, who purportedly is an anti-Diluvian uh, American spirit who had inhabited the Midwest of the United States about 16,000 years ago. Now, Winchester, after all of these revelations to him, spent the next 10 years of his life, well into the 1880s, um, publicizing the Andersons and their work um, and teachings. And their teachings usually were simple messages about universal brotherhood. And he, in fact, organized the Museum of Spirit Art to collect the Andersons' work and the work of other spirit artists at the time. And as you might imagine, that was in San Francisco. In the process, he created quite a cottage, cottage industry that illustrates the interrelations between the various stages, uh, phases of spiritualism at the time. First you have the medium Cooper in Ohio, uh, who gave forth the teachings of the spirits and named them. Um, you have the Andersons in California, working from Cooper's descriptions and names, who painted the spirits' pictures, and frequently added to the spirits um, illegible scrawls, purporting to be handwriting, which in turn were interpreted and translated by the medium Cooper in Ohio, and the finished paintings uh, in their turn were psychometrized, as the term was at the time, um, by another very famous medium by the name of Anna Kimball, who has her own story, which we can't go into now. Now, the final category of spirit paintings that I want to talk about tonight, and by far the most wonderful, consisted of paintings that were done directly by the spirit itself, himself or herself, without the physical intervention of the medium. Now this was, as you might imagine, less common. Since the prestidigitation, to take a cynical view required, was extraordinary. 
So the chances for exposure uh, were far greater. But when this direct spirit art, as I call it, uh, was, was properly performed, it was indeed astonishing. Now the greatest of the direct spirit art mediums was a Scotsman by the name of David Dugud, D-U-G-U-I-D, who was born in 1832 and died in 1907. And he practiced his skills all around the world, starting out in Glasgow. Um, he was for a time, considerable time in England, he was in France. Um, he spent many years in Australia, all the while um, practicing as the medium for direct spirit art. Um, he spent his early years before becoming a medium, totally without any training art, as he always emphasized, as a cabinet. In the 1860s, he began mediating the teachings of a variety of elevated dead, including Hafed, Prince of Persia, Jesus, and Buddha, all of which were published in interminable volumes. Um, he also mediated Marcus Baker, um, a spirit who finally revealed that he was in fact the spirit of a dead 17th century painter, painter by the name of Jacob Roysdale. And he also mediated another dead Dutch painter of the 17th century by the name of Jan Steen. Mm -hmm. Now, Dugan's methods vary. Sometimes he would fall into a light trance and then himself pick up a paintbrush, go to the easel, and paint uh, a painting much like the ones you see in front of you now. Um, at other times, he would sit and trance in a chair, tied to the chair, in the best 19th century fashion, and through the gloom of the darkened seance room, his audience would hear and indistinctly see the spirits directly painting their pictures upon the easel. Come in, next picture, there. Plaster cast of a spirit's foot. This is William Oxley. Um, he claimed to have obtained a plaster cast of a spirit's foot. In about 1874, he became totally and absolutely enamored of work of David Dugan, and in fact moved to Glasgow um, so he could attend upon Dugan um, and listen to his revelations, um, usually uh, revelations about the actual happenings of the life of Jesus, but also to have observed his spirit art. Um, give me the next page. Um, Let's see. And this is one of, uh, of David Dugood's uh, paintings done in, in uh, 1875 for William Oxley in Glasgow. And this is uh, uh, Teresa Jacobi, also known as the Angel Purity. Um, and uh, uh, things I would ask you to note about this, uh, first of all, as the period is 1875, uh, immediately after the Catholic Church made a dogma of the Catholic Church, the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, and uh, using a symbolism almost precisely identical to the one um, in this picture. You can hardly see it here because of the, the way the, uh, um, the slide is, but you see standing upon a globe, standing with a serpent uh, circling the globe. Um, Pardon me? That's the apparition. Yes, very, very common in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Catholic, Catholic iconology, and uh, Duga's use of it is unexplained, but, uh, unless you get in a fairly cynical and assume, as we'll discuss in a minute, that, that he was uh, borrowing from something that was commonly used at the time. Um, now, at the bottom of the picture of the angel purity, um, there's a certificate. And in just absolutely classic 19th century fashion, signed by uh, Oxley himself. And this is what he says about this, this painting. He says, drawn directly by spirits in Glasgow on Friday no evening, November 30th, 1875, in the presence of the names of uh, several spiritualists. And this is how he says the painting was done. The plain paper was put in an envelope. The three gentlemen placed their fingers on the sealed envelope, turned off the gas, and in three minutes the gas, this is the gas light, was turned on and the envelope cut open when the drawing was found as above. Now, give me the next slide. 
Um, this is another one of uh, Dupin's uh, uh, pictures from uh, 1875, and it's actually my favorite. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful drawing. And mainly it's a wonderful drawing because of the face of the, uh, of the angel who's unnamed. And the quizzical expression on, I take it to be a woman, of her face, and uh, the position of the knees and the arm on the, on the hip. It's a lovely picture. Give me the next one. Um, this is another one of Dupin's pictures. Now, the first thing that should be remarked about all of these paintings, drawings, rather, um, is that the spirit is not a particularly good artist, despite his name to be a 17th century Dutch painter. Um, I suppose, however, that the old adage is really true um, about the dancing horse. It's not so wonderful that a horse dances uh, badly or well, but rather that he dances at all. The amazing thing that David Dubois and William Oxley and others is to be believed is that these were produced directly by a spirit. Um, now, Dubois was never exposed as a fraud, and he practiced his, his uh, craft and trade for more than 40 years. Um, he had several close scrapes, however, most notably when one of his pictures that's in his book um, on Hafed, Prince of Persia, which he says um, shows Hafed, Prince of Persia, with his arm outstretched and pointing into the distance, was revealed, in fact, to be a line-for-line -line drawing, horizontally reversed, something we'll talk about in a minute, um, with a picture that appeared in Castle's illustrated Bible over time. Um, this took a lot of explaining, as you might imagine, on the part of, of uh, Hafed, Prince of Persia. Now, um, you may have heard of Frank Podmore, who was a famous parapsychologist at the end of the 19th century. And in his book on 19th century spiritualism, he talks about a seance he attended with David Duggar. Um, and he came away very impressed. He said that when he went into the room, he met Duggar, shook his hand. Duggar took a clean blank sheet of paper, like this, showed it to Podmore, tore off the corner, handed the corner to Podmore, put the picture on the easel, sat down in a chair, had Podmore tie him up, and the usual sort of, of stuff they did in those days to avoid tricks. And when the lights were turned back up, lo and behold, there was a drawing on the easel. And lo and behold, when Podmore took the piece of paper out of his pocket, it matched the, uh, um, the piece that had been torn from the now painted drawing. Podmore said that he came away impressed, and he was impressed for several years afterwards, and it wasn't until perhaps five years after the event when he realized what had really been done to him by Duguid, uh, at least in his opinion, that what Duguid had done was switch the corners that he tore off of the painting. I mean, it seems fairly obvious now to people who are watching magic on television, but that's, the Podmore came to the conclusion that that's what had been done. That, that, that Dukwit's skill was really the best of the distinction of holding a torn corner of an already painted painting and drawing in his hand and switching that to the one that he torn off. There may, however, be other explanations. Now, um, give me the next slide. Here. I want to talk for a minute about an unlikely person to view as a spirit painter, <coughs> uh, spirit artist, and that's Madame Blavatsky. And I assume everybody in this audience has heard of Madame Blavatsky. Um, and if you haven't, I'll just say a few words. She was a Russian noble woman. She was born in 1831. She came to America in 1873. She started the Theosophical Society in 1875. She moved to India. She died in London in 1891. She's left vast literature behind her. It's a society which still um, exists with several um, of its branches being represented here in New York. Um, whatever you may think of Madame Blavatsky, uh, it's almost certain that you would not think of Madame Blavatsky um, as a spirit artist. And yet, when she first appeared in New York in 1873, and in the early days before she left for India at the end of 1878, that is in fact what Madame Blavatsky was doing. And the main impetus for the spread of the Theosophical Society in the early years um, I submit, uh, was in fact a species of direct spirit art. 
Um, now, the first thing to say about uh, Madame Blavatsky as a spirit um, artist uh, is the fact, the rather curious fact, this, uh, that both she and Colonel Olcott, this is a picture of Colonel Olcott, who founded the Theosophical Society with her, were both emphatic in their writings that she utterly and completely lacked artistic talent. And yet, as you might expect of a woman who was a genteel, um, a gentlewoman with a sort of training that women had in those days, in the 1840s and 1850s. In fact, she was quite skilled um, in the use of a pen and pencil. And this is not a spirit drawing by Madame Blavatsky, but a regular drawing by Madame Blavatsky that she made of, of uh, Colonel Wolcott. And this is a poor slide of it. But actually, it's very talented. Uh, you would be quite proud to, to uh, produce a painting like this in any state of consciousness. Give me the next one. Now this um, is John King, and we've talked about John King, the master of paints, who appeared at the Boone's family seances in Ohio in the 1850s. But after the 1850s, he's not stopped appearing. He appeared with the Davenport Brothers and a variety of other mediums. And finally, in the early 1870s, when this trend of spiritualism that I talked about at the beginning toward ever-increasing phenomenalization, materialization, and theatricality that reached its peak. By the early 1870s, John King, or a spirit calling himself John King, was appearing in London to a medium by the name of Charles Williams. And uh, uh, John King, by the early 1870s, had developed the ability to show his face, to materialize himself. He reached the either the pinnacle or the nadir of spiritualism um, at the time. Um, and uh, at first, John King would show his face at this uh, medium Charles Williams cabinet and ask people just to look at it. And finally, um, he asked a painter in the audience, uh, who was unnamed, but was called investigator, um, actually to arrange lights so that the spirit John King could show his face and have it drawn for the, the uh, thousands or millions, perhaps, of spiritualists around the world um, who were eager to see what he looked like. Uh, this was done, and the picture appeared in the uh, great spiritualist journal, Human Nature, in the spring of 1874, and in the summer of 1874, in the Boston Banner of Life, which was the leading American uh, spiritualist journal. Now, by 1870, um, there had been some consensus among the um, the mediums and spiritualists about who exactly John King was. And who he was was supposed to have been a 16th century British privateer by the name of Henry de Morgan. Um, so when this painting appeared in uh, Human Nature and then in the Banner of Light, it was supposed to be John King, um, alias, or in the earlier life, uh, Henry de Morgan. And the first thing I'd, I'd ask you to uh, uh, note about the painting is the fact that this you know, scarcely looks like the costume of a 16th century British privateer. Um, but for future purposes of what I'm going to say next, what I'd ask you to look at is the curious turban, especially this point over here, which looks like the bill of the hat. In fact, it's no such thing. What it is is, this is not a great you know, slide and reproduction of it, but what it really is is, it's just a, a uh, artifact of the printing process. The turban itself does not have this peak. In fact, it goes down over here, but it's very difficult to see. It was very difficult uh, for the people who looked at the banner of light um, and human nature uh, in 1874 to see as well. Now, this becomes important for reasons that I'm about to tell you. Um, now, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that spirit photography is closely related to uh, uh, spirit art. And the spirit photographers of the time, now that they had seen what John King looked like in, in their life, um, were not to be outdone. And in Paris in the 1870s, there was a medium by the name of John Bouguet. Um, and John Bouguet was a medium um, whose specialty was, as might be expected, um, mediating John King, and mediating John King in such materialized form that the materialized form of John King 
could be photographed. And in fact, it's a, you know, um, a series of slides, a series of pictures that were taken in Paris in 1874 uh, and 1875 um, with Bouguet as the medium and a man by the name of Le Marie, a good friend of Madame Blasi, um, um, in which the, the spirit of John King appears and in fact is photographed. Give me the next slide, right? Now this is a very poor slide, but this is John Bouguet. <coughs> this is John King. And I don't know if you can, even if you stand back a little bit, you can make it out. <laughs> Um, and you can identify John King generally by the features and the fact that he's carrying, as he was wont to do in those days, what's called a spirit light. But the thing that I would uh, most like to point out to you is the turban. And what do you see in the turban? What do you see in the turban is a bill over here. And what had begun as an artifact of the printing in human nature and the banner of light in the picture of John King that first appeared is now a state of the, um, uh, the features of John King as he is to appear hereafter. Um, but the most notable, noticeable thing about this is the fact that the face of John King is reversed horizontally, left to right. If you remember the earlier picture of John King from the Banner of Light, it's the identical picture, but horizontally reversed, so that the bill of the cap um, is on the other side. Now, um, what are we to make of this horizontal reversal? The first thing I would point out is that it was very common in spirit drawings and spirit paintings uh, to have exactly this sort of left to right horizontal uh, reversal of images. Give me the next slide. Here. Now, this is a, um, on the left, is a picture of the adept Lewis, Lewis the Bee, um, um, whose books Ghostland and Art and Magic, Emma Harding Britain edited and published um, in the middle 1870s. Um, this original picture of Lewis was sent by Emma Harding Britain to Madame Blavatsky. I think to, in, in a sense, to one up Madame Blavatsky and say, well, you may have John King as your spirit, but I have the adept Lewis. Madame Blavatsky, not to be outdone, um, this is the story told by Colonel Olcott, took this picture, lay it on the table, put a piece of paper on top of it, rubbed her hand on it, and immediately produced the picture on the right, uh, replete, as you'll notice, with the face of an imp or an elemental looking over the shoulder um, of Lewis. Um, whatever the truth of that story, um, the noticeable thing here again, and I could repeat this over and over, is the fact that the original is reversed horizontally. Why would that be? To answer that question, you have to think for a moment, in the days before photocopiers, how would you go about making a copy of a picture? And the answer was simple, and it was well known and taught to school children at the time. If you want to make a copy of this picture for yourself, the simplest thing to do is to take a tissue and lay it over it, take a very soft lead picture, pencil, trace out the outlines and the general features of this, take the tissue, lay it on a piece of clean white paper, and rub the back. And when you rub the back, you're going to be creating on a clean blank sheet of paper um, an exact duplicate of what it is you've traced, except horizontal and reverse. I'm not here tonight to decide the issue of why horizontal reversal is almost a universal phenomenon um, in spirit painting in the 19th century, but a cynical person, I think, could uh, very easily come to the conclusion that what was going on was a form of prestidigitation and copy. Um, give me the next slide. Um, now we come to the um, Madame Blavatsky's picture of John King. We've seen John King done by investigator um, in England when uh, Charles Williams was mediating John King and asked investigator to draw. We saw Bouguet's spirit photo of John King. And now we come to the spring of 1875 when Madame Blavatsky uh, set out to impress 
uh, General Francis James Lippitt, who was a patent lawyer up in Boston um, and had been a general in his early days out in California. Um, and she wrote to uh, General Lippitt in March of 1875, and she said, John King, who at the time um, was the presiding spirit over uh, Madame Blavatsky's life, John King wants to send you his photograph. He's asked me to buy a yard square uh, piece of satin, um, and I've done that, and I've covered it with a uh, um, tack that to a picture frame and covered it, and we will see what John King will do with it. Um, over the next couple weeks, she sends yet further letters to uh, General Lippitt up in Boston, um, and uh, the upshot finally is what you see uh, before you. Now, Colonel Olcott says, um, and Colonel Olcott, um, while many people in the 19th century um, did not respect his uh, intelligence, um, no one in the 19th century that I know of questioned his honesty. Um, he said that very frequently he saw um, this picture being drawn directly uh, while Madame Blavatsky was either not in the room was at his side and unable to reach him. Um, whatever the truth of that, um, what I want to point out to you is a picture of John King as he supposedly uh, painted himself from Madame Blavatsky to give to General Francis uh, Lippitt in uh, 1875, um, is, again, a curious bill on the hat. Um, and the, uh, I think the conclusion is inescapable. Um, the facts are that this is a left-to-right uh, horizontally reversed copy of the uh, original picture that appeared in the Banner of Light, which Madame Wolofsky, in fact, had hanging on her wall frame. Um, but more than that, um, the curious thing is that John King, the spirit, uh, by the spring of 1875, had come to, to take upon himself um, as a, one of the features of his appearance, what had begun as an artifact of the printing process originally. Now, the ultimate fate of this painting is rather interesting. Uh, it still exists, and it's an ad jar um, in India, and Madame Blavatsky in her later years, when John King was no longer her constant companion, uh, came to identify this spirit, um, uh, this picture, as a picture of her master Valerian, Mahatma Valerian. Um, give me the next slide. Um, the John King um, picture, um, as I said, is not unique in Madame Blavatsky's work. Uh, but I'd like to show you a special painting uh, by Madame Blavatsky that Michael Gomes, you may know, and I found in, in California last year at a place called the Temple of the People of Halcyon. Um, this is a triptych. Um, you can see the two panels here. They fold um, this way, presumably continuing the same barn burner uh, design uh, on the back of the panels. Um, very, very elaborate um, uh, uh, picture. And this uh, survives today only as a photograph. Um, I have a large copy of it here. I'll be happy to show you uh, afterwards. Um, as a photograph, um, but signed originally by Madame Blavatsky um, at the bottom, um, whereon she attests that this picture is the result of half an hour's trying. Trying is a technical term at the time related to Pascal Beverly Randolph. Um, a half an hour's trying in a darkened room in the spring of 1874. Um, You can't, uh, you can't read the handwriting um, here now because the slide is reversed. Um, uh, but let me see if I can find the text for you. This is the attestation. Um, and in these sorts of things in the 19th century, they're almost universal. This attestation reads, this unfinished pencil sketch was drawn by a lady of distinction, but utterly ignorant concerning the art herein expressed, 
at Union Square, New York, in the presence of several persons and within a period not exceeding 30 minutes. It was done in March 1874, more than a year prior to this notice, and has meanwhile been treated as a worthless cardboard. Now this is one of the very earliest pictures, uh, pieces of evidence at all, one of the very earliest pieces of evidence of what Madame Blavatsky was doing from the time she arrived in the United States in July of 1873 until she appears in the public notice in the fall of 1874. Um, Note the insistence of the pictures being the result of trying uh, by her in a darkened room, and the certi certification that the process took more, no more than 30 minutes, which is one of the hallmarks of the spirit medium in the 1860s and 1870s. The pictures must be miraculous because they were produced by the artist in such a short time. Now, no mention is made uh, anywhere in this picture or in the attestation of John King's being involved in the production of the work of art. But in a later letter from Colonel Alcott, um, it appears um, that uh, he's taking John King to task because, in fact, the, um, the drawings at the top of this were, again, reproductions of work horizontally uh, reversed, as we talked uh, repeatedly about, uh, of a work that was already in print when this was made by Madame de Bosco. Now, um, having said all that, uh, can you turn the lights on now? I'm done with it. Yeah, having said all that, where are we with, uh, um, with spirit art? Um, I've discussed this tonight in a kind of a light-hearted, tongue-in-cheek way. And I don't want you to think that I, uh, because of that, that I um, disparage spiritualism itself. I view spirit art, and indeed materializations in general, and the, the whole progress of spiritualism up through the 1870s and 1880s, more or less as a, an addition to, an aberration from um, spiritualism. It's a fascinating subject. Spirit art is just great. The people we've talked about uh, today with William Oxley and Madame Blavatsky are not at all isolated. Um, and the phenomenon was not limited to the United States or to Britain. Uh, in France, for example, you had Victor Hennequin, um, who was a, uh, um, a politician of some note, a musician of even greater note, a friend of Victor Hugo's, and a very, very sincere spirit artist. And he was also insane. And it was his insanity <laughs> that convinced Victor Hugo that spiritualism was dangerous and should be abandoned. Um, the United States also produced... Um, perhaps the, the greatest of the uh, spirit artists, a woman um, um, named Miss Disdebar, D-I-S-S Debar, D-E-B-A-R, who fascinated New York in the 1880s by claiming to be the daughter of Lola Montez. And you may remember Lola Montez as the mistress of Ludwig of Bavaria, among many other people. She claimed to be the daughter of Lola Montez and Ludwig. Um, and claimed that she was the Princess Editha. She was also the greatest of the spirit artists, and I don't show you any of her pictures here tonight for the simple reason that none, as far as I can tell, survives. Um, she came to the public notice in the late 1880s when she was the, you know, on the receiving end of a criminal charge right here in New York County that rivaled for publicity what's going on today with Miss Lewinsky. She was charged with defrauding a lawyer out of $60,000 at a time when $60,000 was real money, um, uh, and his house um, by um, convincing him that the spirits that controlled her um, could produce spirit art, and not only produce spirit art, but good spirit art, which as we've seen is somewhat unusual, and could do so in commercial quantities, and that he could in fact make money by backing her uh, in her spirit art projects. Um, she was tried in, uh, um, down at uh, 100 Center Street in 1888 uh, and convicted of fraud. And at her trial, they produced, they being the prosecution, um, two stage magicians who could produce most of her tricks, if they were tricks, but could not produce um, what was really her masterpiece, the thing that sets her aside 
in the realm of direct spirit uh, artists. And that is, um, at least according to uh, the lawyer whom she defrauded, who testified on her behalf at trial, um, she could sit in a room such as this room with an easel such as this one. And she could sit in the far corner and not approach it at all, and while the audience was watching, have emerge upon the uh, canvas a freshly painted, and from all uh, tales, a um, quite artistic um, oil painting with the oil still wet. Um, if she did this by prestidigitation, it could not be uh, imitated at the time by stage magicians. And indeed, it's very hard to imagine, assuming everybody was not deceived, um, how she could have done it. Um, um, Miss Distabar went on to uh, even greater fame. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the history of occultism may know of the Order of the Golden Dawn. And she appears a few years later um, in England, where this time she's Madame Poros. And... Um, is again convicted of fraud, but quite a different fraud this time. Um, in singling out these people, the, the curious, the odd, the fakers, the fraudulent, uh, for our attention tonight, I've done it really because um, I think the subject um, deserves examples of spirit art. Um, the conclusion then would be that uh, spiritualism aside, um, and I say spiritualism aside because we've come a very long way from the simple message to the Fox sisters and the simple procedure of a knock for a yes or no answer. Um, leaving spiritualism aside, the way to view spirit art, um, I submit, is an example of popular entertainment in the 19th century. Thank you. If you have any questions... How did you get into this niche, this particular thing? Because I, <clears throat> one of my hobbies is to uh, try to make a collection, a list, of all of the spiritualist journals in the 19th century and where they are and what survives of them. And at one time when I was younger and didn't know how big this was, I was going to read all of them. And one of the things that leapt out at me was that there was an awful lot of spirit mediums out there who were painting, I mean, painting and drawing and all this stuff. And so I started collecting them and realized I was on to something. And then last year, let me, this is very, very quickly, last year in England I was talking to a man about spirit art and David Duguid. And he said, oh, my mother's great aunt left her a bunch of stuff in a closet. Would you be interested? And, <laughs> um, and this is what he gave. I have a whole raft of them here. I'd be happy to show them to you. These are David Duguid's originals. Um, and he said, do you want them? I mean, this is great. Um, so here is, for example, Teresa Jacoby as the Angel Purity. Um, and this was produced in three minutes with the gas off. And so we have uh, original spirit paintings. But other than these, and in England today, spirit art is, is actually uh, somewhat studied as a branch of psychotic art. And there have been some showings in England of some very unfortunate people who were um, locked up in various madhouses at the time and produced what the time, they didn't know what they were, but now they're viewed as psychotic art. But in fact, there's some species of spirit art. Um, but other than those pieces of art and these, and the odd little bit here and there, and a lot of spirit photographs. What I really lack is spirit paintings. So if you guys have some great aunt stuff in your closet, I would be happy to uh, to see them. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um. Whatever happened to Madame Poros after she got out of jail? Um, she served the, the, the New York jail term. She served on, uh, um, it wasn't Rikers Island at the time. It's the one in the East River over here. Island. What's it called? Roosevelt Island. On Roosevelt Island, but yeah, that's right. It's Roosevelt Island, yeah. yeah. It was Blackwell, maybe. Yeah, it was Blackwell. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, she was in disgrace and hiding for a while, went to England. After she was convicted in 
three, four, I think it was, he served a longer stretch that time, and then she vanishes. I mean, I, um, if you know uh, uh, Eric Dingwall, who's a great parapsychology historian, um, he has a chapter on her, um, and he's gone to all the newspapers at the time. But I don't recall that he has her what happened to her after that. You know, she may have lost her powers or gone straight or any of a variety of things. Uh, a recent book, The Golden Dawn Scrapbook, has a drawing of Madame Horos during, taken, made during the trial. Yeah, that's in Dingwall's book, too. That's good, yeah. Um, yes, do you? Oh, well, there was a, just a comment about how Blake um, used to draw his spirits that came to him, and in some ways uh, there's always been this relationship between uh, spirits and painters and, and artists and things like that. Yes. But I find this a really fascinating area. Have you come across the uh, painter who Ingo pointed out to me, Ethel de Rosignol, uh, from, uh, we believe she's uh, British, but uh, she did a highly accomplished uh, psychic art or spiritualist uh, guided uh, work in, the, I guess, the early part of the 20th century, late, you know, the symbolist period and various things like that. But uh, uh, just curious, because it's very difficult to find any of her work. And uh, are you working on a book on this subject? No, I wish someone who knew something about art would uh, do something about it. But what you're saying points out, I think, the difficulty of this. How do you, um, how do you distinguish this sort of, um, this little niche world in spiritualism from stuff like Blake, for example? Right. Um, and you can question a lot of things about Blake, but not his sincerity. Um, and there are people, um, even today, if you take your well, browser on the World Wide Web and punch in spirit painting, you will get about two dozen uh, web pages showing current spirit art. Um, I would say most of it are the variety you're talking about, which is visionary, visionary art, not the phenomenal sort of thing that I talked about tonight. But I'm seeing a visionary or American Indian visionary art. Um, and are they related? Um, in theory, yes, but in in practice, I think most of these people uh, were just doing their best in a very hard world to survive and make a living. And I think they viewed it as that. Um, even though someone like Duguid, if you take David Duguid as an example, why would you spend 40 years of your life cranking out these god-awful, I'm talking thousands of pages of stuff, which is very it's dry and it's boring, uh, for the kind of meager remuneration you could expect um, unless you actually were seriously uh, convinced at some level that you were dealing with reality. Um, but even having said that, I think that the great majority of the people that I talked about tonight, um, I think that probably the, uh, the showmanship and the, the financial side of it were uh, preeminent. And I know in addition to the person you've mentioned, a friend of mine in Holland said that there's a Dutch a man, artist. Yes, I know him. Oh, oh very good. Um, There's no evidence that these people really exist, except in his head. And maybe they are, maybe they're not. But there, there's no. I'm a scientist, and I look at the evidence. You can't find that. You can't find in the 17th century Jan Steen or Jakob Roysdale. I've looked. No. Um, no, I was going to say Jan Cornelius van der Heide. Huh? Jan Cornelius van der Heide. You're talking about. Well, those are legitimate painters. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. 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 No, but you can't find that he's got the dates wrong. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's got. He right. was trying very hard, I think, to uh, um, to you know give a kind of verisimilitude to his um, to his tale, but got the details a little bit wrong. I mean, he was um, he wasn't an, an educated man. He was doing the best he could with what he had in front of him. Right. Um, anyway. Yes. There exists uh, in South America by uh, several artists were done works uh, which are spiritual in the sense that no spirit, individual spirit was allowed, but in a different spiritual level. 
And uh, I didn't have a chance to see it in the book, which was published uh, now in Europe in Prague. And uh, it is fascinating that different people in different time did the same paintings, absolutely the same paintings. And uh, I would uh, I would compare it to actual painting because I would say most painters, most serious painters, are spiritual painters, if they want or not, because otherwise it's impossible to paint. Look at this, what you are showing. You are showing angels. They are beautiful, sexual, female, which everybody would like to have. That's input of real person. It has nothing to do with the spirit, mm -hmm. because uh, artists as such can do, can, uh, can contribute by composition, by our view of our eyes. But uh, I am not uh, persuaded that the spirits would see the same thing in the same uh, same positions or same uh, same uh, color or whatever it is, because we have special limitation in our eyes how we see. And I see it when I'm, I'm painting. I see it when I'm painting. There is a momentum or when, let's say, I start a portrait. Let's say yours, and you will sit, and I will start to work. And your board will be absolutely in calmness, our body will be calm. It means we will not breathe. Like, so we will get less oxygen. And it means our brain will start to produce higher waves, will function more on the higher frequency to get more, to pump it in. It means we will get to alpha state, which is, which is uh, possible of uh, uh, telepathy communication on different levels. And it is happening very frequently. And it is happening so that we are communicating uh, about past and, uh, and future without knowing that. I don't believe in one thing, that in painting, after it is possible to verbalize something and to say, oh, it was so, it was so. It is impossible because it is visual image and uh, as possible a spiritual image from different levels, spiritual level which is produced later. And then, this thing is deposited into this painting. And as we see on paintings from 18th century, 17th, 16th, 15th, Renaissance and so, these paintings are still carrying this charge, which was inputted into them by one person or two people. And this undisputable. And there is, uh, when there is possible to, also visually, uh, therefore, I'm against, uh, uh, against verbalizing things. Uh, I'm speaking with this accent because I was working on it a long time. Mm -hmm. you know, so otherwise, I could speak uh, Oxford. <laughs> Let's see. What happened to us? I am now, I'm now working on illustrations of books, um, a new book, where I was contemplating the transfer of uh, physiological and uh, physiological transfer of a human body into... Uh, animal forms into lower forms and uh, I woke up in, in the morning at 4 o'clock and I was lying next to my wife and thinking about it intensively for about half an hour and then I fell asleep, fell asleep and when we woke up about an hour and a half later she said I had a terrible nightmare that animals was following me and, and they were letting me and all of a sudden they were vanishing and new animals were following me and I said okay tell me about these animals it was identical we transferred our dream. I, my my inner thinking was uh, put into her dream, and uh, it was fascinating. And it was, I think, it was uh, nothing. I was like uh, astonished by that, but it was a nice, funny game. <laughs> I would yeah. say it's possible to do. And therefore, also uh, when somebody starts to say, "Oh, this fascinating," start to be excited, especially in painting, in producing painting. Oh, this exciting! I am in different level. Everything finished. Everything finished. Vanishes and uh, uh, almost never returns. It must be spontaneous, without particle interest involved in it, and it has to go uh, uh, like you know, flow, which is uninterrupted. And this is the beauty of it, seeing things, like children are absorbing, and they have communication mm -hmm. with the world. We know it all. They are communicating so beautifully to each other, and we don't know how. Because they are communicating some pictures, some kind of different ideas that we have. And then we, then we limit everything into words. And then we pretend that spirits are contacting us and we are explaining them in words. They have to feel not pity for us. That is so, so little possibility for them uh, to communicate through words. 
and uh, maybe the spirits who are contacting us are on the lowest level because I never heard that somebody uh, I would like to speak to Embra. So, <laughs> sorry, he does not want to. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any what, 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 what is your source for Victor Hugo turning against spiritualism because he thought people would go nuts? He wrote, there's a book called uh, the Tav Tunand. Uh, yes, I know. What's the in there. What's the Jersey. Jersey, that's yeah. right, in yeah. Jersey. Um, and um, there's a, um, some biography, I don't know if Hugo, he did, he, he became afraid of it. It's not that he turned against it and rejected it. He became afraid, maybe I misspoke. He became afraid of the um, the active experimentation in spiritualism that he had been doing, and realized that uh, he could, you know, get into a position that he could probably go completely and finally insane as his friend did. He didn't lose a baby himself. Yes. Could you speak a little more about the direct spirit yeah, painting, thing. where like no hands were involved? And do you have any insight as to, in you know, any details about fraud versus authenticity? Um, I'll be happy to speak about it. And do I have any? My own humble opinion um, is that we're dealing with uh, fraud in this. And, but fraud is a very hard word. And it's a lawyer and all. Illusion. Uh, you're, what you're dealing with here is energy. You're dealing with a form of entertainment for whatever purpose. You, when you say fraud, it sounds so hard and awful. That, uh, for example, let's assume that Madame Blavatsky in her early years was not above um, this sort of, of deception. To call it fraud is, uh, is to put a gloss on it that may not have been there at the time. It may not have been there in your own mind. It may have been some trick that she had, or that Do Good had, or someone else had, to impress people to follow her very serious <coughs> ideas that she had about something else. I'm the last person who wants to say that Madame Blavatsky is just an utter fraud. Um, but I'd be the first person to say that when it served her purposes, she was not above performing tricks on people like Colonel Holcott. Um, so I think that all of these people who were uh, in that wave of materialized spirits and phenomenalizations of theatricality of the 1870s and 80s. And, um, every one of them that was doing this kind of direct spirit art was doing it fraudulently, with the understanding that that doesn't necessarily mean bad faith. Um, and at the trial of Miss Distabar uh, in New York, the two um, stage magicians who took the stand um, to prosecute her had a variety of, of um, methods that they dreamed up uh, by which you could produce direct spirit art. And some of them you see on television. You have a, a canvas painted with a white wash over it, and then if you just run a little water on it, the canvas, the white wash will run down and you'll have a picture revealed. Maybe. Um, you have a, um, what is this, mosquito netting painted black slightly above the, the picture that's here, and it's pressed down into the wet paint, and the picture comes through. And they had a lot of clever ideas. And the only thing about Miss Distabar was, if she's actually telling the truth, um, and her victim, um, the lawyer she was defrauding, is telling the truth, that's not what she did. What she did is sat in that corner, and the picture was over here, and the picture appeared. And I don't know what to make of that, except I'm more ready to believe illusion and just we're all human beings and we nap every now and then that I have to believe that a spirit would waste his time and come down and draw a picture for some artist in New York. <coughs> yeah. What is your source for Miss Distabar before she became Madame Boris? <coughs> the, the newspaper accounts, of, you mean the fact that she was really actually a First generation Irish serving girl named Delia Ann O'Sullivan. That part, that's, not, that's, the, that's the newspapers. The newspapers at the time, because at her trial they produced her uh, two half sisters or a half sister and a half brother who said, This is not the daughter of uh, Lola Montez. Da, da, da. She's Delia Ann O'Sullivan and her mother's Katie, and by God, we came from Ireland. Um, so that's all, that's all I know about her. Just newspapers. Yeah, newspapers. Yeah. Yes, I'd love a certificate. I know, it'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, if you were going to really do the book on this stuff, which you can't do, right? Cash mean, checks is better. Yes. You know, <laughs> Endorse. 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 Yeah. Uh, have, have you encountered uh, Ted Sirius's uh, uh, photography in I've, this century? Um, I've read uh, Martin Gardner, whom you may know, yeah. who's a debunker of this stuff. And, uh, oh, and he's one of my heroes. I just think the world of him. Um, I read his what he says about Ted Sirius, but I don't know. And he thinks nothing. He thinks he was a pure D con man. But I don't know anything about him. No, he's not a con man. You, you didn't look at uh, Jewel Eisenbuds. Did not. I have not at all. Um, it's very curious, and it relates to some of the uh, phenomena that goes on, uh, like the reversals and the strange changes of, of one image. Well, does reversal like take that. place there as well? Yes. Well, oh, that's interesting. That's fascinating. It yeah. also takes place in remote viewing. I've never remotely viewed. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, is that right? If you're doing a um, clairvoyant vertical. Which way? Uh, vertically reversal? North can be south and east can be west. Interesting. Yeah, reversals is a great uh, mystery in all, all types of parapsychology research where visual images are concerned. Yes. Um, as we, we could say 30% of the time that the targets are reversed when they come through, generally speaking. Interesting. Do you have a theory on why? No. Nobody understands that. Yes. I, I just wanted to make another comment um, to call your attention to an intriguing parallel for what it's worth. Uh, I don't know if you were present uh, last month when Dr. Ullman gave a talk on some seances that he had participated in as a young boy with a group of friends. And in these seances, uh, they would receive messages from a purported discarnate spirit, and what would happen was a pencil would write by itself and leave long messages on a blank piece of paper, hundreds of words long sometimes. Okay. Uh, and this happened in uh, near total darkness, but uh, apparently all the, the people sitting at the table had their hands touching, and they could kind of see the outline of the hands, so that they feel that the pencil was writing by itself. And these long messages would happen in a period of just a few minutes. You know, pages and pages and pages. And the parallel here is that these uh, complex paintings were supposedly produced in a very short time. Yes. Look, maybe I'm wrong. My, my feeling is, um, and it's just the cynicism of old age, my feeling is that for me to actually believe that, other than to read about it and study it and find it fascinating, um, I would have to see it. And as far as I know, no one is doing direct spirit painting now, although there's still a spiritualist camp in Indiana um, where spirit painting is practiced in the summer times. Um, and apparently they'll teach you the uh, art, the art, or I guess how to go about becoming a spirit artist. No. Yes? Um, in defense of psychic photography, which is a major study with me, yes, it is capable of total scientific verification of test conditions. I have done this. Now, Ted Sirius came to me originally, and I threw him out because he was an alcoholic. But he convinced me that he was dinner. Now, I cannot vouch for him. I have no doubts about Ted Sirius, because Martin Gilman is not a fool. Yes, psych... Your eyes are not a fool. What? Your eyes are not a fool. Dr. William Wolf wasn't the fool either. Well, <laughs> I, I know, but I haven't done it. I, no, no. I know from my own experiments and the test conditions, while well, psychic photography can be faked very easily, the ones I'm familiar with were not fake. There was no way they were fake. They were done under absolute test condition. Why not? There's nothing supernatural. If you're talking about energy, thought forms that are transferred to the body of a medium, the, I would say the solar plexus part of the body, from a mind, whether it's a spirit mind or a living mind, as if there were a difference, um, onto a light-sensitive surface. We've done this hundreds and hundreds of times experimentally, it has happened to many, many uh, innocent people uh, spontaneously. Psychic photography is real. Not all of it is real. Some of it is. And there's nothing particularly astonishing about it. And I rest my case until next January. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Just, um, you were talking about um, 
the drawings being done very rapidly. Uh, there, there are a variety of uh, spirit artists, for lack of a better term, mediums, uh, both in Brazil and in England, like Matthew Manning uh, yeah. back in the 60s yeah. and 70s. But now currently in Brazil, there's a whole flood of mediums that do these very rapid spirit drawings. And, and some of them claim to be able to produce also direct uh, drawings, what you call direct art. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, I think, is, and I was curious what's your opinion, in, especially in South America, Brazil, Colombia, where you, where you have these, you don't have spirit photography, so it's, it's not very common. And spirit drawings are still very common, which you would think, you know, it was a theory, at least in the spiritual, spiritualist camps in America, and even in their own journals, the spirit photography was the logical evolution. They talked in these yeah. evolutionary terms of drawings, from drawings to photography. But no. you, you don't really see that in, in, in Brazil and, and things like that. No connection at all. Yeah, no connection. I don't know. I'm glad. I, mean, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was a spirit photography in South America. I yeah. heard of the drawings. But I didn't know the reversal too, wasn't there's there. there's some studies with subliminal perception, uh, where images flash, and that person has to choose one or one or another, and they'll they'll tend to choose the reverse image. There, so there, there is some brain connection with, with reverse. Of course, with, with uh, left and right reversal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With left and right, only left and right. Yeah. yeah you never see it. I've never seen spirit art or read about it. This reverse. Uh, North, South, or vertical. Anybody else? If anyone would like to look at uh, some more of uh, <laughs> of uh, David Ducat's uh, drawings, I have some of them here. I'll be happy to show them. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate it very much. And I suggest all of you should go home and look in your grandmother's closet. And if yes. you find anything, post haste. Hi there. My name is Lisa Coley, and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I want to welcome you to the Foundation's YouTube channel. There's already a wealth of information available posted, and we have plans to continue to post our classic lectures and new materials, so you don't want to miss out. So hit that bell, please subscribe, and you'll be notified. And hope you enjoy. <laughs>